Regarding men, number 29, circumcision, the first cut is the deepest. We'll be missing Janice Fiamengo tonight, but we expect her back next week. Welcome everyone to Regarding Men, and uh, tonight we're going to be talking about Regarding Men, but we're going to be missing Janice Fiamengo. A sad thing, Paul. Yes, it is. Janice, it's, 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 not, well. not that she's not going to be here, but she's had some troubles and uh, difficulties, and she won't be here tonight. But I think Paul and I can handle this one. We're going to be talking about circumcision. Circumcision is one of the things that really bugs me. And let me tell you why. They cut off this thing called the foreskin. And it's a little baby. And sometimes they don't use any kind of anesthetic. They just cut it. Which we'll talk about later what that does to the little boy's body chemistry. But what do they cut off? They cut off this thing called the foreskin, which in a man, a grown man, is about the same size of skin as a postcard. It's huge. And this foreskin has several thousand, at least several thousand, specialized nerve cells for pleasure. Some of those nerve cells are called Meisner corpuscles. And those Meisner corpuscles are fantastic little nerve endings that only respond to pleasure. You only find these Meisner corpuscles, Paul, in the lips, the nipples, the genitals, and the very tips of your fingers. They're very specialized. And so imagine that, you know, you're cut off from these pleasure, pleasure sensing pieces that get cut and thrown away. So your sex life obviously is going to be less pleasurable because you're missing those several thousand uh, neurons or not neurons, what do you call them, Paul? Nerve endings. Well, well, they're nerve endings, and sometimes they're not thrown away. Sometimes they're used to make facial cream. No, oh, God, we'll get into that too. So sad. And of course, Oprah is the one who pushes it. Yes. So that the ladies' faces can look prettier, they, they use the foreskin for that. Instead of being a bearing on the penis, that's what the foreskin does. It's like a bearing. It covers the penis, and it slides with the penis so that... As the penis goes into the vagina, this foreskin slides with the movement. So it's, it acts like a bearing. And so they say that it decreases the amount of pressure it takes to penetrate. And it also apparently is more pleasurable to the women. You know, they've done studies and they've shown that, that women prefer uncircumcised males having sex with. It's interesting, eh? But uh, yeah. it, it does more than that. I mean, it's amazing. It acts as a seal for the vagina, the foreskin acts as a seal in the vagina so that the sperm and vaginal juices do not come out. It, it keeps it in. I remember many times where the bed became a very wet, you know, no seal for me. Anyway, it acts as a seal and it also holds this vaginal fluid so it ha helps in lubricating. And it does all kinds of things. Paul, what else? What else does it do? Well, I want to I want to back up for a moment and Let's start with the difficulty there is talking about this subject, even in the red pill community. Yes. It's very unfortunate. Um, I've noticed, you know, I've done a talk on, and I don't call it circumcision anymore. I call it what it is, which is male genital mutilation. Yes. Um, and I noticed that uh, many times in the comments, even in the, and unfortunately, especially in the red pill community, you get guys who, Typically, and we're going to talk about how this happens. The guy's talking about, well, I was circumcised and I'm just fine. Right. Or, what are you making a big deal? It's it's healthy. The, the, right. the doctors say it prevents urinary tract infections in, in <laughs> infants and, and it's a healthy thing to do. Or some people try to support it on religious grounds. Um, and, you know, with all respect, I think if your God tells you to mutilate a baby's penis, you need a new God, get a new one. Um, and, and, you know, that may sound offensive. What can I say? We're talking about mutilating infants here. Really? Yeah. Taking off parts of the body that are sensitive. I mean, the most sensitive part you can imagine and taking it off and throwing it away or giving it to the skins companies, you know, geez. And what we've established, what the science has established is that, a male genital mutilation removes up to 75% of the erogenous tissue. Is that right? 75? 
up to 75. I mean, it varies depending on the circumcision. And certainly, you know, even from human to human, you have a variance of how many nerve endings are yes. in the foreskin. Yes. Uh, but it does remove up to 75% of the erogenous wow. tissue. So when guys say, I'm circumcised and I'm just fine, they're saying that because they have no idea. They've never had an idea of what it's like to not be circumcised. Yeah, they have no point of reference. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it's like, you know, I've seen guys before talking about, well, I'm very gynocentric and it hasn't hurt me. Right. Um, and of course, they don't have any point of reference. All they know is pleasing women. And their own experience, that's all they know. And their own experience. For good reason. Um, it, it's, it's hard to fault them entirely. But yes. here we are in a movement that is charged with advocating for men and boys. And one of the least popular topics in this is the fact that we introduce boys in this country, especially in the United States. We introduce them to life at the edge of a blade cutting off their erogenous tissue. Oh, man. Do it, make no mistake about it, for the money. It's yes. about the money. Part of what we should be talking about too, Tom, is the history of male genital mutilation, how it came to pass in this country. Because, you know, by the mid-1850s, it was out of vogue completely. Nobody was doing it. And then a man named Harvey Kellogg oh. came along. Yep. And he was a very prudish, devout <laughs> Christian who basically made it his life's mission to popularize male genital mutilation for the sake of preventing boys from masturbating. Right. And of course, we know how well that works out because circumcised boys don't masturbate. Uh, this is not conjecture. I mean, this is li literally written down. You know, his writings can, you can go back and look at it. And that's exactly what he said. You know, that will keep them from masturbating so much by doing this. Crazy. Uh, and that is, I'm guessing, since we really don't know the actual roots of MGM across the world. I mean, we know it's an ancient practice. We don't know exactly where it came from, how it developed, or what the reasons are. But I think it's probably safe to assume it had something to do with sexual control, too, uh, with controlling the sexual urges or the attempt to well, control sexual urges. Of that's what everyone would believe it has to do with as far as female genital mutilation. Right. You know, exactly. It's to keep her from having pleasure. And I think that it's pretty easy to assume it's the same thing for these guys. And of course, we regard that practice as barbaric. I think Ann Coulter once said that we, we made female genital mutilation illegal 20 minutes after we found out what it was. <laughs> uh, and, but male genital mutilation? Not so yeah. much. It, there is one, I'm gonna, we're going to have a link below. If you don't know the science, if you think you know about male genital mutilation, or if you call it circumcision, and you think you know the science on it, that it's a health benefit, it prevents um, um, uh, urinary tract infections and other problems, um, it does, they see some people claim that it, it slightly reduces the chance of penile cancer. Uh, in boys that are circumcised. But if you want to know, there's a link to neonatalcutting.org below that will give you tons and tons of research demonstrating babies die from this. Yes. There isn't a great medical benefit. When we tell, we have, we know, for instance, that one in 111 boys will get penile cancer in their life if they're uncircumcised. We know that one in eight women gets breast cancer. Are we going to turn to radical mastectomies every time a girl turns 13 to prevent it? Um, plus the, uh, the urinary tract infections. We generally have this thing called soap and water. It's, it's been around for a good long while. And teaching boys to keep that area clean and how to keep it clean yes. should be a part of upbringing. But the fact of the matter is the research points to this as a very, there is a multitude of problems. It is not one, for instance, we know that when a boy has his, has his genitals cut, that cortisol levels spike. Cortisol is a hormone released under very stress, uh, stressful or painful situations. And it alters brain chemistry. 
profoundly, especially in babies. And we know that the cortisol levels in babies remain spiked for up to six months. Now, can you imagine what that does developmentally? It's why they're tying MGM to late onset sexual dysfunction in men. It's why it's being tied to anxiety disorders in men. Yes. And this is where the research is pointing. Yes. And yet it is a $1.2 billion industry, Tom. That's uh, it. And, and that's money. just for the cuts. That doesn't count the money they're making selling the foreskins off yeah. to, to cosmetic companies. It's crazy. Absolutely insane. It is. It's a barbaric practice. It's hard to imagine how we can be in 2019 <laughs> and have all this science available. And by the way, we're the worst at it, Americans. I was going to say that. We're the laughing stock. Yes, you go to Europe, they're not cutting all the boys there. You go mm -hmm. to Canada, they, they have discredited it there and have recommended not doing it. As a yeah. matter of fact, they would, the Canadian government, which provides health care for the citizenry, has removed funding for it. If you want to get circumcised, you have to pay for it because the yeah. government doesn't see any medical benefit to it. Uh, they don't do it in Mexico. It's just the United States. Europe doesn't do it. Australia largely doesn't do it. Um, but here in America, it's become a corrupt business, and the doctors performing it, one of the bits of research you can find on neonatalcutting.org is that there is studies that have been done now demonstrating the bias in circumcised researchers, which I found fascinating, Tom. Yeah, that makes sense. That circumcised researchers tend to find medical benefits. <laughs> and, and why is that? <sighs> Maybe it's very hard to look at what your parents had done to you or what was done to you. Yes. It, and largely, a lot of people do it because they want their sons to look like the fathers. Nah, um, I hear you. Or for actually for unconscious reasons so it's a lot of people take them to get circumcised because that's just what you do <laughs> so dad you got your finger cut off in a in a terrible accident at your job when your son's born do you want him to look like you and cut his finger off probably not uh, same deal though because we wouldn't dream of doing that to a finger right right or to a female or to a female, but if you're a boy, you start off in life. You know, there's all this talk uh. in the anti-FGM movement about genital integrity, that you deserve to have a whole body, that women do. Yes. And even a lot of anti-FGM proponents don't give a damn about what's happening with boys. They right. don't want that included in their conversation. Um, is it amazing? It, it is absolutely amazing. It's jaw dropping. It's just and if, and if you sense that Tom and I both are angry about this or frustrated right. with it, because we are. It's, a, it's just, a, oh man, this is fucked up. Yes. Man, it's, just, <laughs> it's just hard to imagine how people could be so blind as to want to cut a little teeny baby's dick off without any kind of anesthesia throws him into a crazy mess. You know, I think Paul, a good case could be made for PTSD for those of us who've been circumcised. Absolutely. Right? And, and the case has been made. It's in the research. Oh, right? org. It is in the research. Interesting. Anxiety disorders, other things associated with trauma. Yeah. The feeling thing, the alexithymia piece, you know, uh, absolutely, alexithymia is another. It, yes, where they found that circumcised boys, boys who were circumcised, are higher in this thing that they've created and called alexithymia. And it's just, you know, it's just one more piece of what happens to boys when they're circumcised. And it's a lot of pieces that add up and up and up and just create a, a mountain of problems, you know. But yeah, the, the average guy is going to go, I don't have a problem. My dick works. You know, I have a good time. Feels good, man. How could I feel any better than this? Well, you could have. Yeah. If you were cut. Yep. If somebody didn't cut it off. And, right. and not only that, there is the 
the fact that it kills a certain amount of babies, uh, I think Dan Bollinger, who was at ICMI 19 this year, yeah. um, he wrote a paper once and did the research estimating that about 100 infants a year die in the United States from the procedure. Um, and then there is all the boys that lose their penises from infection and from other, well, and it's hard to call it a botched circumcision. The idea really is that MGM itself is a botched medical procedure, even if it goes perfectly according you know, to their standards. It's still a screwed up thing to do. Yes. It gets worse with infections, with lost penises and lost lives, all so the doctors can make some of this stuff yep. off of it. Yep. Um, there's been cases uh, with um, Orthodox Jews who have passed herpes to babies because they do a, a ceremony where they circumcise the baby, right. then suck the blood from the penis. Right. There's been many babies that have oh. contracted herpes, at, you know, right after birth. That's bad. And it's a religious ceremony. It, it, it's like, and look, here, you know, I know I was really snarky and said, get a new God. But here's the thing. <laughs> if you want, as a matter of religious ceremony, to cut the erogenous tissue off of your penis, fine, do it when you're fucking 21 or 18 really? or whatever your really? state considers to be adult. It's up to you. If your religion does not give you the right to assault infants and sexually mutilate them. The, the idea that it does is absolutely insane. Yeah. And there are, there are Jewish groups that have come out against circumcision. I was going to point that out. Yeah, you're, you're going to see that link. And there's yes. doctors that have come out against circumcision. Yes. They don't happen to be the doctors that are making all the cash off of it, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, a, it's a horrible, horrible practice. It's a barbaric practice. And, and it's done right out in the open, and I don't see any end in sight. I know. And it's amazing how the split, the gynocentrism pushes it so that the needs of girls are, oh, no, we can't cut her. But the needs of boys, ah, cut him up, use it cut for skins up. medica. Throw it out. Uh -huh. And much to, to my discomfort at times when I see otherwise really supportive, uh, active red pill guys or concerned about the issues facing men and boys when they're faced with the issue of circumcision are like, yeah, what are you making a big deal about? You right. know, right. Like, who even remembers it? It's not that big a deal. I'm just, oh, it's a very difficult issue because we're talking about our dick. <laughs> you know, yes. we rarely will talk about that. Men don't talk about that very often. You know, it's, it's, it's hush hush. And then to have to admit somebody cut, the most, most potent part of my body, you know, the most sensitive part, they cut it. I'm not whole. I mean, to come up and to admit that, that's hard for a man. It is hard. And oh. it, it's, it, there's a lot of underlying issues to that. But here's yeah. what I encourage guys. Look, I'm not here to tell anybody what to say or what point to argue. But I do think that if you actually read research on male genital mutilation, if you actually understood what was happening with that, that you wouldn't be so aloof about, you know, oh, well, no big deal. It, it happened to me and I'm just fine. Yes. Uh, we need to stop this from happening in this culture. Yes. Uh, yes. There are groups that are hard at work with this and they're, they're going to clinics where uh, MGM is performed and they're protesting and they're walking in with microphones and cameras. And I'd salute those guys. I and mean, they're, they're doing great work and yes. they need to continue, but they're up against a billion dollar industry. Yes. And when that's a rough thing in America, because as we all know, money talks and bullshit. Uh -huh. Indeed it does. There's a man named Lindsay Watkins that wrote a book. In fact, I happen to have a copy right here. Unspeakable Mutilations. And Paul, he talks about the whole idea of circumcision coma. He says that most men who have been cut are in what he calls this circumcision coma, where we just don't even think about the idea that we've been mutilated. It's an interesting concept. Oh, yeah. And I see it at play all the time. We're even at ICMI, a couple of guys I talk to about circumcision, 
you could see their eyes glaze over yes. in the same way that when you're talking to men about gynocentrism or hypergamy and guys that can't face the difficulty of looking at that stuff, their yeah. eyes glaze over and yeah. they, they go into a zone where they're hearing what you're saying, but not really. Yes. Uh, it's hard. It's the same thing. It's the same phenomena. It's really hard. And you know, this is uh, the guy that wrote the book and I did a study together about circumcision specifically about how men who went into therapy to try and help themselves adjust to realizing they'd been cut, uh, get treated. And Paul, it was fascinating. You, we will leave a link below to the, uh, the article that we wrote, but it was amazing. I mean, and just as the bias in the researchers, the males who were circumcised, the same thing you see with therapists, the male therapists were the worst. They were Absolutely. just the worst. You know, they just, they, you can see in the article the kinds of things that these guys went through. And the, the guys basically said, look, this is really a hard thing for me to deal with. And it's embarrassing. And it's a lot of shame around my penis and my concern over my penis. And so I go to a therapist and what do they do? They tell me I should be grateful. <laughs> you know? They, oh, yeah. Think they about tell me get over it. Get. And- go meditate. I mean, they, all kinds of things. I mean, it's just crazy, you know. But yes, let's talk about your abuse issues, but not the circumcision part. Uh, f- not the not the abuse where you had the end of your penis severed. Yes, uh, but think about this, Paul. A, a woman comes to a therapist who has been. He, she is, she says she was mutilated, sexually mutilated, when she was a little girl. How is she treated? You oh, they'll call a whole treated. team of therapists to help her. And they, oh, they sympathize, they empathize, they listen to her, et cetera, et cetera. Compare that with what we found with these guys. And what we found was people were cold, cold. There, there were some, in fact, like, there's more women that were empathic than the men. Um, but a lot of the women weren't that much better. But some of the women were actually um, pretty good, you know, but... Uh, not very many. So look out, guys. No, there's not going to be. I mean, if you, if you talk to the average therapist about circumcision, you'll see their eyes glaze over too. Exactly, because they're not. They haven't dealt with it. These guys are probably circumcised. They're not. They're just like the researchers. You know, they're going to be biased. And <laughs> I mean, some of the things the guys, the therapists would tell these guys was just amazing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, about, well, my son's circumcision was botched the first time, so we had him do it again. It's like, Ugh! <laughs> you're telling someone who's concerned over themselves being amputated, oh, well, you had that amputation done for someone else. It's like, no, that's nutty. No therapist should be doing that. Oh, absolutely not, but they do. And, of course, you know, guys tend to heal not just through talking, but through doing something. That's where these... Uh, the, um, oh gosh, Paul, what do they call them? The, the circumcision sites where the guys are re, um, redoing their, their foreskin. Oh, what's the word for it, Paul? Oh, and, re- it's foreskin restoration. Thank you. Foreskin restoration. And those guys support each other because they know what's going on. You know, they're not going to tell him <laughs> to, you know, that he's something wrong with him, that he should be grateful. They're going to be supporting him. So this is a place where, these men found they could go, that they could get some help and some support, you know? So my hat, my hat is off to those sites, you know, the foreskin restoration site. And I'm, I apologize for not remembering the name of them because it's critical. It's really important for these guys to be able to experience that. I'm sure they'll forgive you, Tom. Oh, I feel forgiven already. Already. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I feel better. You know, this is one of the things, you know, I've dedicated my adult life, to advocating for men and boys. And yes. I know a lot of people who have. Tom's one, and I know a bunch of others. And it, it just strikes me still of how far we have to go that we can't even collectively recognize that the first cut is the deepest, that that is where advocacy for men and boys should start yes. by allowing them to come into the world without excruciating pain and disfigurement for life yes. for the sake of some doctor being able to drive a Maserati. Um, and I just can't imagine, you know, what it's going to take. Uh, but I do know that I want to focus more on that in my work in the future. Hmm. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure what we're going to do. There's already guys out there doing as good as you can do and really getting up in these doctors' faces yes. and confronting them on camera about what they're doing. Yes. Uh, but it's just hard. This is America. Yes. It's, it's a very hard thing to get across. There are some good things happening. You know, that circumcision movie. Do you remember the title? Got American it. Circumcision. There you go. American Circumcision. Excellent piece of work. We'll Have put it. a link to that below. Yes. yes. Critical. Good stuff. You know? And I tell you what, you want to brace yourself to watch that thing too. It is disturbing. Yes. It will wake you up. And it should be. Yes. It should be disturbing. That's exactly right. And what we're doing is just, just inhuman. You know? One of the best... I mean, I know there's guys of all ages that watch these videos that we do, watch these discussions that support us on Patreon and other places. One of the best things, if you can convince somebody to not cut their son, I think that's one of the best forms of activism you Amen. could possibly do. Amen. If you can save one baby boy from being mutilated for profit, that's as red pill activist as you can possibly get. I agree. And it makes a difference. It does make a difference. For that guy, it sure makes a difference. Sure you know? it does. Uh, yeah. And it might help his parents understand that what happened to the, to what happened to the father, because God knows we don't cut women in this culture. Yes. Uh, and if, if we do, we throw people in jail for long periods of time. Yep. Uh, it's amazing to me Tom, how this can just, that double standard can just be right out in the open. Cut a girl, go to prison. <laughs> cut exactly. a boy, get paid. And Paul, there's no, I mean, cut a girl, there's no allowance for any kind of religious ceremony. No, no. There's no allowance for anything. You know, whereas the boys, they say, well, he's, it's a religious thing, you know. No, with the girls, they say, no, you can't do that. Yep. But the boys, oh, go ahead and cut him. <sighs> cut him, by the way. I think I need a jar of that face cream. It's oh man. $200 an ounce. Is that what it is? 200 bucks an ounce. It's really expensive stuff. Jeez. Uh, they're making huge money off of this suffering. Yeah. Are they still selling that stuff? They're still selling it. Yes, is that are. right? Yep. No law against it. Yeah. Skins Medica. That's the company, right? Um, I think that's one. I think there's more than one company. Oh, is that right? That. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, guys, the uh, this was advertised by Oprah, you know. Oh, which means it must be good. It must be good, and no one would hurt anybody who was she was advertising for them. Yeah, absolutely not. Oh, boy, gracious! Yeah, well. uh, I think I've had about all this I can stand for one day, Golden. Yeah, I'm thinking the viewers have had just about enough too. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, hey, listen, if you made it to the end of this talk, thank you. Special <laughs> kudos. If you weren't one of the ones that tuned out when it started getting rough. Um, exactly. I really this, appreciate that. This is tough stuff. This is it not is. easy. So, yeah, if you've gotten this far, you get special kudos. Yeah. And we'll hopefully Janice will be back with us next time, eh? Absolutely. I hope Janice heals up just fine. Yeah. Back with us next time. And in the meantime, two things. One, think before you cut. Yeah, really. Being and two men are good. Absolutely, as are you. Indeed, they are. That's good. Well, Paul, you take good care. We'll see you. See you Next guys. Time, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye.